everybody, E here. Welcome to the best books of the decade. I only have one hard rule for this, and that is these books had to have been published between 2010 and 2019. How I compiled this list was I stood in my office and I looked around and I picked out, I think, a total of 21 books right off the bat, and then I started to we not weed <laughs> well yeah i started to you know whittle down the stack to the books that meant the most to me for specific reasons and finally i ended up with five of them if i were to if i had more time i would do best books of the decade and i wouldn't do just five but my time is short uh, i don't have much time right now it being the holidays and certain things happening in my life and my career uh, all good things all positive i'm very very happy right now but i decided to cut it down to five and these are the books that either came along right when i needed them this past decade or books that just defined the decade for me at number five so at number five we have grasshopper jungle by andrew smith this is a book that uh, came, came along. I will always remember the point in time that I read it. I was quitting smoking, and I, I read this book maybe over the course of, uh, I don't know, just a couple of days, maybe three or four days. But it was there for me when the withdrawals and everything were the worst, when my attitude was the absolute worst. The author's description of the place that he was in when he was writing the book meant a lot to me also. Andrew Smith felt like he was... In, in a rut. He was writing the same thing over and over again. Um, he's a young adult author. He felt like he wasn't pushing the genre anywhere new, so he decided to stop writing uh, for publication and start writing for fun again. So he started writing, and this is the book that came out. This book is also beautiful. It's got a uh, neon green binding, not binding, but dust jacket. It's got a black inside, but the, the actual, it's, uh, what are they called, sprayed edges, uh, is the same color as the dust jacket. It's a beautiful book, and it, if I'm honest, it's the reason why I grabbed it. This book is wild. It is crazy. Um, it is also a Our Voices, um, if you want to go into hashtags and trending. Uh, the book is about a young man who is struggling with his sexuality. Uh, he has a best friend and a girlfriend, and he's trying to decide between these two people while basically the end of the world is happening. Um, but it's not like a dystopian or anything like that. This is a book unlike anything else I have ever read, period. And I feel it's because Andrew Smith, Andrew Smith just threw it all out the window and decided he was just going to start writing. And I think the best books are written that way. Um, being an author myself, when I'm reading someone else's material, I can tell if it's plotted. I can tell that, okay, these are story notes, these are stepping stones to get to a bigger purpose. Books like this, you just don't know where they're going to go, and that's the magic of fiction for me. At number four. Okay, so at number four, we have Eleanor by Jason Gurley. Uh, I'm shocked that this is on the list. Uh, considering I don't talk about it nearly enough. The only time I've really given it a video, uh, I need to do a review of it here on the channel, but the only time I've really done a video of it is, uh, I think, top five books that nobody ever talks about, fantastic novels that nobody ever talks about, and I think that's one of the reasons why I'm putting it on this list, to give it a little more visibility. From what I understand, the book was self-published, and it was much longer or shorter. I can't remember which one it is, but then uh, Crown came in and bought the rights to it, and completely re-edited it. Uh, I don't know if stuff, stuff was added or taken away. I'm not sure. But it is a very, very clean experience. Um, I, there are so, there's so much in here about depression, uh, postpartum depression, about the loss of a child. So much in here regarding those things. Uh, things that I went through myself. Of course, I didn't go through postpartum depression. But there's, I have some history with losing a child. And... That there's so much in here that I that I felt I felt close to, and Jason really hit the mark uh, for. I'm talking about the Jason Gurley really hit the mark as far as those things were concerned. The the land, the uh, fantasy world that he creates, and it's not really a fantasy novel. It's more of a fantasy novel that you might see a Neil Gaiman write, but it's. 
he creates this world that is so dark and dour and depressing. I keep using dour. I'm not sure if it means that or not. But it's very dark, um, sinister. And there's one land in particular with dinosaurs. And watching that land, what happens to that land over time, has stuck with me. And it's one of those it's one of those stories that is embedded in my nature now. Anytime I think about not feeling good, or anytime I think about, you know, how depressed I am, how bad things are, when it usually isn't really that bad, I think of this book. I think of the imagery that Gurley, you know, projected into my mind, and it's absolutely amazing. I love this book. It is easily one of my favorite books of all time, though it might not be on my top 20. Actually, I can't remember if it is or not. But it's one of those books where the author completely stole me away from reality and put me in another place and then made me reconsider how I looked at my own emotions. At number three, right, at number three we have a book that nobody will be surprised to see on uh, my best of the decade list and that is You by Caroline Kepnes. This book changed the game, uh, it changed the thriller game, it changed the way people looked at stalker fiction, it changed everything. Uh, after this book came out, it spawned loads of, I don't want to say mimicry, um, there, there was, but there were plenty of books that came out in response to this book, which is interesting enough because I believe this book was in response to Gone Girl. Um, but uh, Araminta Hall's Our Kind of Cruelty, uh, I Feel the Doll Factory by Elizabeth McNeil, I feel that kind of, it, it was kind of on the same vein. Uh, is it any wonder that McNeil's book and Kepnes's book are from the same publisher? I think not. Uh, two completely different stories, but they all seem like, uh, they, they seem like responses to these books. And I don't know if McNeil's was or not. I don't know that for sure, but I believe that You was a response to Gone Girl. Um, it, it did so much for the bad guy as the protagonist, or the, the main character being a bad guy. Uh, I feel it's done an even better job for that than Patricia Highsmith's uh, The Talented Mr. Ripley. I never liked Ripley in those books. I loved Joe in this book. And any time uh, an author can make me love a character that I shouldn't love, that I shouldn't have feelings about, and make me despise a character that we should be rooting for, I think that is a sleight of hand that cannot go unappreciated. Um, unappreciated? Unappreciated. <laughs> That's a word. <laughs> so, uh, but Caroline Kepnes, she's also a fantastic person. Um, she's very open and accessible. Uh, she will... She, I don't know if she responds to everybody, but she's she's responded to me, she's talked to me on Twitter, she, she's very open, very nice person, and I love all the success that she is seeing because, in my opinion, she deserves every single minute of it. At number two. Okay, at number two is probably another book that people will not be shocked that's on this list. It is easily my favorite Stephen King book of the decade, and that is Revival by Stephen King. And in case you're wondering, no, The Institute, even though it's in my top five now, is nowhere close to this book. Um, this, this book, I cheered. I was crying, I was upset, but I cheered at the end of this book because it was a return to form for my favorite author of all time. It was one of those, it was the feeling like you, you saw a long-lost friend walk through the door again and they were in good health and they were doing really well for themselves. And you see him and you're like... I knew it. I knew you were capable of this. Um, the, the book was polarizing in that a lot of people, a lot of people, when I wrote my review, they were upset because they went out and bought the book based on my reaction to it. Um, and in fact, after that, I changed my whole way that I talk about books to other people. And whenever anybody asks me, hey, do you think that such and such book is worth it? I am now answering everybody, I don't know. I don't know what you are going to think is worth it. I have no idea what is going on in your head or your life at that moment, but this book to me was important. This book felt, like I said, like a return to form for Stephen King. And no, I'm not talking about a return to horror. This book isn't a, a, a scary, it is terrifying to me. Um, even as an atheist, it is terrifying to me. Um, the, the book touches on things, it's just the, the, the will to live. Where does our will to live come from? Also, it dealt with something that I was feeling 
at that point in time when I read it, which was the fleeting nature of life, how quickly life goes by. When we're children, we all think, oh, you know, well, we're going to live forever. That's what coming of age means, you know, other than the sexual aspect. It also means realizing that the world is maybe not as innocent as you believe. Um, in this book, he, he tackles everything that is relevant to that theme. It is a perfect thematic ex experience in that he it comes completely full circle. Uh, the all the questions that the Charlie Charlie Jacobs, I believe his name is, uh, the pastor asks, or all the stuff that he says in in his speech to his congregation just before he quits, all of that stuff mirrored all the questions and feelings I had when I left Christianity. When I realized that, and if you're a Christian, that's fine. I don't mind spirituality. I have more against a religion than I have against spirituality, but. Um, it mirrored everything that I had, that no questions, that no definitive answers to the questions that I had. And on top of that, I saw if there is a God, this is not someone that I want to worship. This is an evil, uh, manipulative, egotistical creature, the, if, if there is a God. And that's just not something that... Uh, that draws my, my want to worship it. it. It tackled a lot of those things, but above and beyond everything else, this book is terrifically written, amazingly written, and I still get excited to this day thinking about this book. While Stephen King's It is still my favorite Stephen King book, this book, year after year, means something more to me. It it's probably, it will never take the place of it because it has so much more than this one. Just just in size alone, this book's like three, four hundred pages. I can't remember. I can never remember how long this one. This one's four hundred pages. It is eleven hundred pages. Um, there's just so much more to it. But as far as the shortest, succinct experience for Stephen King's writing, Revival is where it's at for me. At number one. Okay, so at number one, we have... Landon, this one's for you since you brought it up on the last stream. Donna Tartt's The Goldfinch. Yes, the rumors are true. I have stopped reading Stephen King's It over and over and over again. I think I stopped at the 18th read-through. I didn't feel it was starting to be diminishing returns. I wasn't getting anything really new out of it. On top of that, this book came along. This is the book. Um, I have a, a paperback and, an, and my audio book alongside my bed. This is the book that I have started reading over and over again. I have read it one more time since my first time, and I found a bunch of new stuff, especially in the audio book. I don't know why, but it it really highlighted certain things. The the production quality of the audio book really highlighted uh, certain aspects that I missed beforehand. I think a lot of it was the inflection of certain uh, dialogue. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll get the same thing when I go back and read. I'm reading the paperback along with the uh, the audiobook, so it's like I'm being read to as I'm reading along. Um, I've read it once, and I've started my third one already. I, I read just a se several pages a night, sometimes 10, sometimes upwards of 20, because this book is really hard to put down. I know that's cliched, but it's for me, it's an, almost impossible to put down, because when I do stop, I don't want to stop, and I'm always saddened when I have to put it down. But uh, Donna Tartt... This is easily the best coming-of-age novel for boys ever written. Um, that it's written by a woman, I don't think it matters. Um, but the, there's the themes of loving your, your, your best friend and wanting to do anything uh, for them. And even if you are a straight, straight boy, the feelings of, of love and the feeling of, you know, sometimes wanting to touch your friend... It, it, I know I know there's going to be a lot of dudes out there going, hey, I never felt that way, but there, she covered this in the book where sometimes, you know, well, not sometimes, the basis of any sexual relationship should always be a friendship um, or any type of relationship, period, should be a friendship, first and foremost, whether, whether it be, you know, two young boys or whether it be adults. And there is no sexual relationship between these boys, um, but there is a friendship that could have possibly led to more of that, even though neither of the boys considered themselves gay. I hope that comes off right. Um, I know there's going to be a lot of people disagreeing with me. I, it, even the director of the movie seemingly disagreed uh, because he said he wanted to tone down that aspect of in the movie. I haven't seen the movie yet. Um, I was hyped for it, but I haven't seen it yet. Uh, in in Tart's book, there 
there's a lot of stuff in there about the the emotional aspect of, of growing up with a friend very close by when you have no one else to turn to and I found a lot of myself in the main character uh, especially the drug addiction uh, I fought with addiction uh, several times in my life, whether it be cigarettes, heroin, alcohol, se several different things. I'm an addictive personality. If I do anything too often, I end up becoming addicted to it. That's just how, it's just how I am. And I suffer withdrawals, you know, even with stuff with, like, food. Um, but the, the purpose of this book, the themes of this book, really, really hit home for me. And... I, I feel that's the reason why it is probably going to end up replacing Stephen King's It as my favorite book of all time. I don't know yet. I'm going to continue researching and studying this book and finding out how in the hell Donna Tartt did what she did. I feel like I know how Stephen King did what he did with It. I feel like I have, you know, mined those depths to completion. With this one, I am really enjoying going back and finding the structure, uh, really nitpicking, figuring out where, you know, the just simple things like when she ends a chapter, when she ends, uh, when she starts a page break, when she does this, that, or the other, to keep you wanting to read, even though the text is very verbose, extremely verbose, uh, it is very, th her descriptions are astoundingly immersive. I don't know, that's one of the main reasons, I don't know how she does it and keeps people entertained. Because when I read fantasy, I get bored very quickly because there's a lot of world building. Well, there's a lot of world building in this one, even though it's set in reality. There's a lot of stuff in there having to do with showing you places that maybe aren't all that popular and that not everybody has been. Uh, like certain museums, certain areas of the desert, uh, tra even track houses. You know, th those things, if you don't have any experience with those things, let's say you live in a trailer park or you've lived in mansions all your life, you don't know what the suburbs are actually like, and track houses can be an oddity to you. I find that stuff interesting, and I find how she made that stuff interesting, I, I, I find that interesting. You know, I, I'm repeating myself now, but those are the things that I really latched on to with this book, along with the themes and along with the story of a boy who does not know where he is going to end up. A boy who is scared and terrified, who ends up jumping into a... jumping into bad things to try and make good things. Making bad decisions to try and help, you know, better his life. Or, if we're just going to be completely honest, escapism. A boy who is running away from himself, who is running away from the world. And that, above all, is why The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt is my favorite book of the decade. So that's it. Those are my top five books of the decade. Um, I know there's going to be some discussion about, hey, why isn't this on here? Why isn't this person on there? Why isn't this book on there? That kind of thing. And that's completely fine. Leave all your comments down in the doobly-doo. I would love to hear from you guys. It doesn't have to be a top five. It can be any list of your best or worst book of, books of the decade. Um, I don't care which. It can be the worst. I'm completely fine with that. Um, if you have any issues with, sorry, my phone just went off. If you have any issues with any of the books that um, I, I posted here, or if you like the books, let me know why you have issues. Let me know why you love them as much as I do. That kind of thing. Let's have a discussion down there in the doobly-doo. But until next time, I have been E, you have been you, this has been the best books of the decade. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye!